we'll go ahead and start. This is just an orientation session to get us ready for practicing Tantra and getting ready for empowerments in particular. So we'll start with setting our motivation. Sange chodon sogi chunam lai janju padu dani kapsuchi dagi chun yen ki pe sonam ki drola penche sange drupa sho sange chodon sogi chunam la janju padu dani kapsuchi dagi chun yen ki pe sonam ki drola penche sange drupa sho sange Chudum sogi chonam thai, janchu padu dani kapsuchi, dagi chun yen ki pe sonam ki, rola penche sange drupa sho. Okay, and so. We think, of course, as always, we study and practice Dharma in order to become enlightened for the benefit of all sentient beings. But in particular, when we start to engage with content related to Tantra, bodhicitta is particularly important. Renunciation is particularly important. And the correct view is, correct, is very, very important. Because this incredibly precious swift vehicle, the diamond vehicle, can become just as easily a cause for the lower realms as it is the swift path to enlightenment. So it's really dependent on our motivation. It's not like Tantra divorced from Sutra is going to work. It actually could make things worse. So if we're really thinking, I might have some parts of me that are intrigued by Tantra because it's exotic or because it's somehow taboo or because the colors and sounds and shapes and all of this is very intriguing to me. That's human and natural, but we're recognizing that that is not the point of Tantra. The magic is not why we chase it. We connect with Tantra in order to become enlightened for the benefit of all sentient beings. Any other reason is not a Mahayana motivation or even a Buddhist reason. So just really consciously thinking, we're gonna talk about and think about Tantra tonight very much for enlightenment, no other reason. And if you have a casual curiosity and that's why you're here, that's not the end of the world. But if you only have curiosity, it's too soon for you to actually practice Tantra. So this orientation session might be a good idea for you, but if you're just kind of tiptoeing around the edges of maybe, maybe not, I'm not sure what this is, it's probably too soon to actually take an empowerment. So during this class, we're just gonna briefly go through basics about Tantra and then the four classes of Tantra. And the reason we're gonna go into the four classes of Tantra is because the empowerment coming up here at Land of Medicine Buddha with Jado Rinpoche goes into the class of Tantra called Yoga Tantra. And this is not as commonly done. We usually do lower Tantra and highest Tantra, but the two in between are much less common. So I thought to just kind of unpack those four classes of Tantra so we have more context, and then actually walk through the stages of what happens during the ritual itself. Things that are in common every single empowerment and things that might be unique in this context. And then hopefully we'll have time for Q&A and just checking in about stuff. So that's what we'll be doing this evening. So we'll go ahead and start with just making sure we're on the same page. So um, remembering that for Tantra, we need some basics, okay? This is not introductory Buddhism. And of all the forms of Buddhism, most of them are completely open practices. Tantra is a closed practice. This is an important distinction for us to make. So in order to practice Buddhist Tantra, you need refuge. So your primary spiritual commitment to and reliance on is the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. Now, if you're just going to dip into Buddhism and use parts of Buddhism, you don't need to have refuge. Yeah, you can take it as a philosophy. You can take it as interesting ideas. But if you're going to practice Tantra, you need to have refuge. It's a prerequisite. And then you also need correctly relying on a spiritual friend, Lama or Guru, and finding a teacher that fulfills the criteria of reliability, namely perfect ethics, a markedly superior understanding of the path to your own, and is renowned to have qualities. So again, in the sutra tradition, you can have a teacher who just knows more than you. 
and that's enough. A teacher that knows more than you is enough to learn things from. You can think of them like a college professor. In the tantric context, they need to have qualities. They need to have stability. These are hard things to quantify. How do we tell? Someone might just have good social skills and be polite. How do we know if they're ethical or not? Someone might be very charismatic. How do we know if that's a quality or just, you know, charisma? So these are a little bit more abstract, which means you don't want to jump into this relationship. You want to take the time to suss them out. So the teacher might be renowned amongst Buddhist circles as someone who is highly realized, but whether that's the case or not, we need to really do deep checking. So fortunately today we have online resources of many varieties. You can watch the teacher online, but I think it's very important to have at least met the teacher in person for some general teachings to get a sense of them before you jump into this incredibly deep commitment with them. Um, it's easy to have the influence of peer pressure, particularly if you're around people who are very excited about a particular empowerment or very excited about a particular teacher. We need to train in having enough objectivity to ask, are they right for me? They might be a perfect teacher, but are they perfect for me? This might be a perfect empowerment, but is it perfect for me? Am I ready for this? Am I ready to commit my life to this process? What will happen if I have a bad day and something slips? Will I slip into some sort of shame spiral or guilt issues? Do I have family of origin issues and religious trauma and all sorts of emotional baggage that I'm bringing to this new process? Am I ready for this kind of commitment? So the teacher is essential. And when you take a tantric empowerment, you are making a deep commitment with the teacher who gave it to you. So it's important for us to realize that when you're taking an empowerment, it's not just about the deity. So for example, lots of people might be waiting for Tara. They love Tara. Tara is beautiful. She's the archetypal mother, swift action and protection. They've been hanging out for a Tara empowerment. Some Lama who they've never heard of is giving a Tara empowerment and they think, yay, good Tara. And so they go not realizing they're also making this incredibly strong karmic bond with the teacher who gave it to them. And it might all be fine. It might all be fine. But what if the teacher shows behaviors that your mind can't quite cope with? What if the teacher shows breaches of ethics or odd things that trouble you or you know that turns out they embezzle money or they are a womanizer or what's going to happen if down the track you find appearances that are not dharmic what's that going to do to your practice so making sure you really check the teacher is really important um so that's huge the other one is to i guess before we go into any more of that do you have any questions about the teacher and finding the teacher particularly in the tantric context how does that sit with you yeah and i think that most of you i think that most of you know these things i think most of you understand the importance of the guru but there is a difference between sutra guru and tantra guru Sutra Guru, you can really see as the mouthpiece or the representative of the Buddha or the enlightened mind for you. The Tantra level, you're being a little bit more direct and a little bit more literal where they become the Buddha for you. Now, this might just be while you're on the cushion doing your practice, or it might be also in daily life, all of their behaviors, your training in this pure view. It depends on the teacher and it depends on your own affinity for Tantra, how literal you make it. But again, choose wisely because if they show behaviors that trouble your mind, it's gonna hugely disturb your practice. Yeah, and what happens if they do? You might have to just respectfully put them and their teachings aside and not give them any more energy. And that is very difficult and very traumatic, and it can cause a lot of cognitive dissonance. And it's much better to just wait and check before jumping into this relationship with people. Yeah, Teresa, so we have someone from the Gompa. No, just uh, shout it out and I'll repeat it for the Zoomers. Um, maybe it's... Oh. 
Uh, shoot it out. She's asking about six session guru yoga. In the practice of succession guru yoga, which will be a daily commitment for the rest of your life from um, if you take yoga tantra or highest yoga tantra, this is a practice we'll be doing daily. In that practice, to see the teacher as inseparable from the deity is part of the practice. This is part of what is called guru yoga, is to see that inseparability like merging. But what you're actually thinking of, what is merging with what? Right. This is the deeper question, because this person that you took the empowerment from is kind of the embodiment of the Dharmakaya mind of all the enlightened beings who they actually are kind of goes beyond our ability to check. They could be more ordinary than you. They could be completely enlightened. They could be anything in between. But because you've decided to see them in this way, you need to continually train in that, but mostly on your cushion during the practice. The rest of the time, that's a little bit more of a debatable point, and you'll get a lot of opinions about that. But while you're on your cushion doing your succession guru yoga, the teacher is inseparable from the deity. Yeah. Yeah. Any teacher questions before we move on? Um, it's a good question. Is, succe is succession the same for yoga and highest yoga tantra? We're checking, but so far the answer is yes. So far the answer is yes. Um, more on that as it develops. And the succession guru yoga practice, for those of you that don't already have that commitment, it takes about 20, 25 minutes in the morning, 20, 25 minutes in the evening. There is shorter versions for desperate times. Don't get used to it, right? Don't get used to doing the short version, but there is that option for when things are really rough. I would suggest that if things are really rough, the longer version will hold you better. But anyway, you've got a little bit of an escape route there. Um, but this practice basically is how you keep the vows that you take during the empowerment. So it's, um, it's like a recipe or like a a checklist of making sure you're keeping all of your samayas purely. You could do it without this practice if you made a lot of intentional activities, but this practice is the most efficient way to keep all of those vows and commitments. So it's best to just focus on that unless your teacher tells you otherwise. So yeah, theoretically, 90% sure yoga and highest yoga tantra, both succession guru yoga is going to be the same. There's a little bit of a question about whether it's um, whether there's a little section in there which is optional for yoga tantra, and we'll check in with Rinpoche about that. But um, it sounds like he's very happy with the idea of people with yoga tantra doing succession forever and ever. I think that would be a really wonderful way to hold the practice. But um, stay tuned for details. Um, other questions? Good so far. Okay, a lot of this is going to be familiar to most of you, but I just want to make sure we're covering our bases. So um, the second piece, besides refuge and relying on the spiritual teacher is the three principal aspects of the path. And I think that you all know the three principal aspects of the path. But if you don't, don't take Tantra. Okay. <laughs> um, it doesn't mean that you have to have a realization of these three, but you do have to understand them and have conviction that they are good and useful, okay? If you don't, why are you doing this practice anyway? If you don't understand it or if you don't like it or you don't agree with it, then why go further with it, you know? So just kind of it's logic-based, yes? But it's an, also a preventative that if you don't get that the point of Tantra is renunciation, getting out of samsara, is bodhicitta, helping all sentient beings do the same, and correct view, being an antidote to samsara. If you don't get that, why are you doing it? Okay, so it's important that um, before you take a tantric commitment that you're really sitting with the three principal aspects of the path and thinking, am I doing tantra because it's fancy or am I using it as the swift vehicle to help me get out of samsara? Am I doing Tantra because people will think that I'm important and that I'm an advanced practitioner and they're going to be really impressed? Or am I doing it because suffering sentient beings exist? My ability to help sentient beings right now is limited. So I need a, a quicker, more efficient path to help more people sooner. 
So this is going to require more effort. It's going to require a level of investment. It's going to require me to kind of let a few frivolous things fall away in my life because I need to give more time to my practice, but I want to because it's going to help me benefit sentient beings. And then you have to ask, do I understand at least intellectually reality? Do I understand that everything, everything, including Tantra, is empty of inherent existence because it dependently arises? Do I understand that at least intellectually? Or am I going to fall into the trap of thinking the teacher is inherently enlightened or the practice is just going to magically fix me or fix samsara? Am I going to fall into a trap of oversimplification or reification? Or am I going to really understand that Tantra, like everything else, depends upon causes and conditions, at least in the case of impermanent phenomena. And in the case of impermanent and permanent phenomena, it depends upon parts and whole and context. For heaven's sake, context. Yes. And then, of course, more subtle being merely imputed by the mind on the valid basis. So just because this is true in, in Sutra doesn't mean we let it go and pretend it's not true in Tantra. It's almost more true in Tantra. Yeah, at least it's more important. So these three principal aspects of the path, absolute essentials before taking Tantra. All right, so here's the summary. Before practicing Tantra, you need to understand, at least intellectually, that the root of cyclic existence, samsara, is innate grasp, innate ignorance about how we exist. The mistake of this type of self-grasping is that it is focused on the conventionally existent I in our own continuum and superimposes an inherent existence to it that is in no way even conventionally there, okay? Et cetera, et cetera. And so, the wisdom realizing emptiness, we cut the root of samsara. With bodhicitta and renunciation, we stop self-cherishing and attachment. Okay, so this is the summary. And then we go on and think, therefore, quickly, quickly, I want tantra. All right. So here's just some key um, things to know about tantra. And if you go, I think we skipped a couple. And this handout that uh, Christine is sharing, this has all been emailed to you. Um, the World of Tibetan Buddhism by His Holiness the Dalai Lama is a really excellent resource. Also, Tantra by Geshe Teshi Sering. And Stairway to the State of Union for those of you that already have Tantra by His Eminence Chudan Rimshe. Okay. Great. So, uh, distinctive features of Tantra, most of which you know. We have Deity Yoga. So this is ripening through rehearsal. What we're doing is taking the result as the path, which are antidotes to ordinary appearance and grasping. So within Tantra, once you have the empowerment, only after you have the empowerment, you're adopting the attitude that you're already enlightened. And so is everyone else. And that the environment is perfect and all sounds are pure mantra. So you need a very stable mind, otherwise this makes you silly or crazy or too Pollyanna rose-colored glasses or strangely hedonistic or you leave ethics. All sorts of nuts kind of attitudes can arise if you don't have foundations before adopting this attitude. But by adopting this attitude, you cut the ordinary appearance of yourself, which identifies as your mistakes or your personality traits or your history or your you know, ancestral lineage or all these things that are just surface and you assume to be somehow self-evident or permanent, it cuts right through all of that. So it's an incredibly powerful way to get to enlightenment quicker. And then we have the three attitudes, which I mentioned before. Um, so yeah, go ahead and keep scrolling. Method and wisdom are uni united and developed simultaneously. And here's where it gets into almost secret, which is the use of particular types of bliss united with the wisdom realizing emptiness. 
So in Tantra, from the very beginning, we unite a few different things. We unite method and wisdom. So compassion, kindness, patience, all the method stuff with wisdom, understanding reality. Instead of two separate projects, we do them at the same time. And then what we also do is we develop calm abiding and special insight simultaneously. So it takes more focus, but it means it's more efficient. Yeah, so there's just some distinct fe features. And yeah, go ahead and keep scrolling. These are just various things to know. Okay, so here we'll look at the four classes. So first, let's look at these two. So most of us have Kriya or Action Tantra. Yeah, this first level. And you might not even know that you can do all of these fun meditations within Kriya Tantra unless you've been studying because it's kind of woven into the sadhanas or sometimes you'll notice some signposting within the sadhanas that kind of indicates these meditations. But I think it's really lovely to dig into them. You can do self-generation through the six devas or the six deities. And you'll see that most famously in the Nungne sadhana of Thousand Arm Chenrezig. And then you have yoga with signs related to relative truth, related to method. So that's abiding in fire and abiding in sound. And then the yoga without signs, concentration that bestows liberation at the end of sound. So this is basically related to emptiness practices. Yeah, the first couple are method and relative. The second two are ultimate and wisdom. The point of Kriya Tantra is long life and health. Why do you want long life and health? So you can practice the path more fully because it's more efficient to have a long life, isn't it? If you suddenly die in your 50s and then you have to kind of start from scratch again, you know, you have all these growing up years, you have all your adolescent angst, and then you meet the path again and have to kind of pick yourself up where you left off and relearn a bunch of things and get distracted by drama and then start practicing again. Isn't it better to live to a ripe old age, free from dementia, and practice the whole time and then maybe become enlightened in the bardo? That'd be wonderful and quite possible. So Kriya Tantra, health, long life. And can you get enlightened using Kriya Tantra alone? It's a debatable point. But many scholars say, no, you need to finally take highest yoga tantra at least at the very end of your path to fully become enlightened. Okay, so Kriya Tantra is things like uh, Green Tara, Medicine Buddha, Avalokiteshvara, Chenrezig. These are our old friends who we see in every Gampa. And then Charya Performance Tantra, we get a bit more of an upgrade in terms of our vows. So with Kriya Tantra, you only have Bodhisattva vows. In Performance Tantra, you have Bodhisattva vows, but you're also being empowered into the five wisdoms. And with both of these two, the emphasis is on the external practice of Buddhism, the external practice of ethics, the external practice of your sadhana, in terms of external behaviors like cleanliness, um, like avoiding certain foods that disrupt the energies, the use of mudra, these hand gestures, which are, of course, all to tell you something internally. You know, it's not like from their own side, they're going to do anything. It's all about internal practices. But these outer methods help touch something internally. And then as you go more advanced, it goes more and more inside. And there's less and less of an emphasis on the external practices. So we'll look at the second two now. OK, so. Kunrig, who Jado Rimshe is giving us the empowerment of, is yoga tantra, which in English is called union tantra. And procedures have the three aspects of purification. So the basis, body, speech, mind, and conduct. Path, great phenomena, wisdom, and action seals. And result, enlightened body, speech, mind, and activities. And generally, these are focused on internal practices. But in Kunrig, there are, is a huge emphasis on mudra. There's a huge emphasis on these external gestures and the importance of those. And Rinpoche will go into that. And here is where you have both bodhisattva and tantric vows, which is why it's, it can be a good idea to do succession guru yoga. And often, it's required. 
Okay, so with highest yoga tantra, you have an addition of taking the three kayas on the path, so that you're really ripening the bases of birth, intermediate state, and bardo. But going back to this union tantra, what's it really doing? In the case of Kunrik, there is a big emphasis on purifying things that might lead to the lower realms. So there's a lot of preventative measures to keep you out of the lower realms. There's also a lot of methods for you to be able to help those who are already there get out, to help others get out of the lower realms. So it's incredibly powerful, particularly Kunrig, who we're going to be taking the empowerment of. Then on the top, there's also practices to help folks in the bardo, in the intermediate state between lives. So of course, any of us at any level can help people in the bardo. But um, with Kunrig, there's some extra karmic influence so that we can be more directly of benefit. And that's due to the prayers that this deity made. So four classes of Tantra in a nutshell, that was quite quick, I realize. And, um, you know, for details, again, see the world of Tibetan Buddhism by His Holiness the Dalai Lama or um, Tantra by Geshe Tashi Sering from the Foundation of Buddhist Thought series. Those two are very clear on the four classes of Tantra. But in terms of how they move from external to internal, they move from coarse to subtle. That's the main thing to understand. So you can stop screen share for now. Okay, so I realized that was quite quick, but do you have just bits you were curious about, about those four classes or um, kind of things that come to mind? Sure, sure go ahead. Yeah, the question was about this practice of combining calm abiding and special insight. And this is a special feature of Tantra. So in Sutra, you're quite right. You develop calm abiding first, or you develop calm abiding as one project, special insight on emptiness as another project, and eventually you bring them together so that within the stability of your single pointed concentration, you can bring the understandings and the analysis and it doesn't disturb your focus, right? This is what we're used to hearing. And we're used to hearing the nine stages of mental abidance where you see the picture of the monk and the rabbit and the elephant and the monkey going up the path and eventually developing stability. We're used to that presentation. Tantra is special. Tantra is special because in the sadhana, what you're doing is Aspects that have analysis, aspects that have stabilization, aspects that have verbalization, you're using all of your senses to become absorbed in something like compassion, for example, rather than analytically thinking through compassion or single pointedly resonating with compassion, you're doing many things simultaneously to absorb yourself in compassion. So Tantra is multitasking meditation. Yeah, it is totally multitasking meditation, and it also is using your five senses for you rather than battling them. Because if you try and meditate single pointedly on the breath, what happens? You think of something, or you visualize something, or you remember the sound of something, you get distracted by your senses. In Tantra, you're using them, making them positive and absorbing in a positive way. So you're using both analytical skills and single pointed skills. In the beginning, it is still kind of alternating, but theoretically you're conjoining those two skills from the very beginning. And that's one of the unique features of Tantra and part of why it's so efficient. So Sutra level, they're two separate projects, Tantra level simultaneously. Yeah, Teresa in the Gompa. Yeah, Teresa seems to be asking, like, is it a good idea to be very formulaic and kind of step by step, making sure your, your senses are cooperating and engaging in the process? Or is it better to kind of intuit it and be a bit more organic and let it happen? And I think that um, as long as your mind has not become indulgent, you know, that you're not going to one form of focus because that's easy. 
easy in one sense means like it can be in the flow, but there can be the other form of easy where it's like that's laziness and only you really know. So I, you don't have to be like thinking, oh, am I doing something verbally with the mantra? Okay. Oh, money, pay me, oh, money, pay me, oh, money, pay me. Okay. I got that going. I got my tactile mala going. Okay. Going now add in visual white, white, it's white light. How many faces? I don't know. Lots of faces. Ooh. Okay. I've got that all going. Oh, money, pay me, money, pay me. Okay. I'm thinking compassion, 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 white light. Oh, money, pay me. Blah, blah, blah. Don't freak yourself out. Right. Like <laughs> gently, <laughs> right. Gently. And what really winds up happening is that you're weaving in layers. And it might be as you weave in layers, one becomes more dominant and the others subside. And it is very much layering in Tantra. Yeah, so the layering in Tantra means different parts of the sadhana, meaning the practice manual become emphasized gently one by one, but you're keeping kind of open awareness about what has come before. So all sadhanas, all tantric manuals will start with refuge in bodhicitta, your old friend refuge in bodhicitta, then usually four immeasurable thoughts, your old friends. And then it goes on, but you're imagining that everything that goes on from there is imbued with refuge bodhicitta and the four immeasurable thoughts. It's not like you're leaving those behind on some journey to enlightenment. You're carrying all of them with you, but you don't have to be like tightly memorizing them and like putting like hard concrete building blocks on top of each other when you do a sadhana. It's more like um, one picture fades into the next, fades into the next, fades into the next, but they're all part of the same photo album. Yeah. And you're not leaving it all behind. It was just, you know, one is informing the next. Yeah. So gently, and I think intuitively in the sense of, you know, what's a good level of concentration for you um intuitively not in the sense of my brain would rather add a soundtrack right now <laughs> you know or something like that definitely avoid getting tight yeah yeah other thoughts i'm looking to the side because that's where my picture is sure Mm. And I'm realizing as I'm going through this process, like, I really like the sense of confidence. Yeah. The confidence pride distinction Teresa is asking about. Yeah. And in Tantra, there is um, the invitation or the uh, really the requirement to have what's called divine pride. And I think the best example of divine pride is His Holiness, the Dalai Lama. So think of how His Holiness he's not subordinate he's not submissive he's not a doormat but he's so humble and we know as buddhists that he's an incredible scholar but in certain formats he just seems like a sweet old man doesn't he and sometimes like in a public talk he's just talking common sense and you're thinking this is not breaking new ground this is obvious what he's saying and then you realize it's only obvious because he's been telling us this for 50 years and so it feels obvious because we're used to it but you know sometimes you hear him and you can fall into the trap of thinking he's just simple and sweet and then you get him in a buddhist setting in a debate setting and this fierce intelligence comes through and this incredible set of knowledge comes through but it's not a performance you know, he doesn't have to prove anything. And when he's with, um, you know, fancy scientists or great politicians or different kind of people that have like status, there is no competitiveness. He's always putting them first. And he's inviting them to share their knowledge, most of which he already knows, probably all of which he already knows. And at no point does he say, yeah, I already knew that, <laughs> right? But he also isn't like, oh, I'm so stupid, I could never figure that out. He doesn't do that. He's just like, wonderful. What a wonderful thing to talk about. What a wonderful thing to know. So he's, he kind of shows us what this divine pride is, which is this very grounded confidence. But in the tantric setting, you're identifying as the result. And the thing that I think is the most important to understand about identifying as something you aren't yet is that it's actually closer to who you are than how you currently think of yourself. Right now we identify as what? Our internal narrative? 
you know, just the words floating through our head, or we identify as our emotions, or our body, or our afflictions, or our qualifications, all of which are very new. All of which are very new. Why do we think this is me? You know, you think of your own name. Oh, this is me, this name. Did you know it was your name when you came out of the womb? Your parents were just like, how about this name? And then you were like, oh, is that my name? And then you believe them and then you learned it and now it feels like you. It's new, you know, and of your whole spectrum of qualities, you shine a spotlight on three or four and say, that is so me. You don't say that is so me so far, or that's how I'm trending, you know, I'm trending this way. You know, that would be more accurate. You're like, so far I'm kind of this way. <laughs> trending as sort of a goofball. Yeah, that is true. I am trending as sort of a goofball, but like, it's not me. It's just where the energy is going. So by identifying as the result, what you're identifying as your mind without its neuroses. Yeah, your mind in its fully fledged state, it's full potential actualized, free from all the mess it has on it now. And that is way closer to you than all of your afflictions and your history and all your baggage. Yeah. So divine pride identifying as the result, and you think the result takes the form of whatever deity you're practicing, this is actually realer and it brings it closer. So you can see how without context, people could get weird about this. You know, you can see how without context, people are walking around going, I'm Manjushri, you know, and like, you're like, are you, are you really, I dabbed out, <laughs> right? But I think something interesting happens when you start identifying as the deity and then everyone else is too, you bring out the best in people. It's a little bit like the opposite, which is our daily life. If we're thinking about how obnoxious people are and how hard they are to communicate with and how they don't get this and that, that's what we hear. That's what we invite from them. Those are the seeds that we water in both ourselves and them. So with the tantric mentality, you're watering the seeds of your own enlightenment, but also theirs as well. And that's very powerful. Yeah divine pride real you know afflicted pride is looking down yeah that's the nature of afflicted pride is when you look down on others so if you're not looking down you're probably going in the right way with it because tantra isn't thinking you're the only one who's the buddha everyone else is too you know it's a it's a full you know full view enlightenment mind it's not just saying you ones what i like you're kunrig and you ones what i don't like you're the mess i'm trying to save grudgingly you know not like that yeah yeah any any other thoughts or questions before we go into the empowerment steps good okay empowerment steps uh yes thank you Okay, scrolling up, that's just some vocab. Okay, so um, this excerpt is from uh, Dr. Burson's website, which I very much recommend, Study Buddhism. Um, Alexander Burson's a great scholar. So the preliminary, this is fun facts to know, but also logistics, okay? So the preliminary is Earlier in the day of the empowerment, the Lama will do what's called a self-entry practice. Basically, he'll initiate himself because he's done all of the requirements to enable him to do that in the past, meaning the long retreat, et cetera. So he's going to do that. And during this time, no one is allowed in the Gampa except for people directly helping the Lama. You know, it depends on the Lama. Sometimes Lamas will say, sure, everyone come in. I'm going to be, you know, rambling in Tibetan and throwing rice and all sorts of stuff's going to be how everybody come on in. But often it's a little bit of a closed thing where the Lama's going to be on a low desk, a low throne, doing his own empowerment of himself. And then he'll upgrade to the big throne and empower everybody else. Yeah, so that's the like the day of the empowerment earlier on. So if logistically you're wondering, why can't I go in the gompa and put down my stuff and get my chair? Uh, it's because we're busy. <laughs> yeah, the gompa is busy. That's why. Okay. All right. So then immediately before the empowerment, students quietly and mindfully gather outside the gompa. When invited in, the students each take a mouthful of blessed water and spit it out. Some traditions say it's okay to swallow it. Okay. Okay. 
depends, mindfully before entering, symbolizing purification before entering the sacred space. Excess water on the hand should be wiped on the head as a sign of respect. So a lot of you will have seen this, where um, before you go in, you have your little hand, yeah, cups, and a monk or a nun or some helper person will have a jug of saffron water and they pour a little bit in your hand and you take it in your mouth, swoosh it around, spit it out mindfully on a plant, not on a footpath. Okay, because it's blessed water. And who blessed it? The Lama blessed it during his self empowerment. So he blessed it for you, gets sent out, everyone else kind of has a ritual cleansing before they enter into the sacred space. So um, do you have any questions about those preliminaries or things you've seen at previous empowerments that you're curious about? You can stop share screen for a sec. Yeah, any, like, before you get into the Gompa questions, stuff that you're curious about. Is there something in the chat there? Oh, okay, great. That bit's clear? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, go ahead, Catherine. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Catherine's asking the very practical question of what if you're on Zoom and you can't swoosh and spit? Um, <laughs> it is a very practical question. And what you do is visualize. But for this part, um, those of you who are doing the empowerment on Zoom, it's really auspicious if before you enter into the space where you're going to be taking the empowerment, even if it's just your home office, brush your teeth. <laughs> yeah, brush your teeth, have some water, have a clean mouth, and I assume it goes without saying, but perhaps not, don't be eating during the empowerment. No snacks, okay? No snacks, All right? But um, throughout the whole empowerment, whenever there is a substance that goes around, the substance that goes around, think whether I understand what this is or not, whether it's coming to me physically or not, I accept happily. And of course you would because you're taking the empowerment, right? So you're not like being forced to do weird stuff you don't want to do. It's going to be in the, you know, the realm of gompa objects, which you've seen before, some of which you understand, some of which you don't. But if you see the Lama hand something to his attendant and his attendant then goes around to the people and maybe touches their hands with it or bonks them on the head with it or asks them to drink or taste it, you think I am doing the same. I happily accept. I am doing the same. I happily accept. So this is true for um, Jada Rinpoche, but it's also true if you're doing this with His Holiness live on YouTube. He offers um, extensive empowerments live these days as well. So just think, I accept that. I accept this. As the years go by, you can study what each of the substances mean, but the Lama's done the blessing. You can just kind of keep it simple so you don't overwhelm yourself the first few and just think, I happily accept. And then as the time goes by, you learn what they mean. But roughly, they're related to each of the five Buddha families. So if you know about that teaching, the substances are related to those and planting the seeds for the five wisdoms. Yeah. Ah, yes. We're... Michael, please ask your question. Oh, I guess I'm the audio guinea pig. <laughs> hey, uh, thank you. Is there, do you have any other recommendations for what we can do to the space that we're going to take the empowerment in? You know, to like a good cleaning, you know, if we have an altar in that same space, should we do water bowl offerings beforehand? I mean, do you have any other suggestions that might help us to get prepared? Thank you. Yeah, yeah, it's a good question. And the audio worked well. Go team. Um, thanks, Michael. <laughs> um, so in your own space, when you're doing these empowerments, it's, it's, a, it's completely acceptable to visualize everything and not have anything there. But if you want to, it does help to have an image of the deity that you're doing the empowerment of. And then even one roll of water bowls is lovely maybe some pretty flowers. Absolutely cleaning is a good idea, but don't feel stressed. The really important thing is that you feel you can have uninterrupted time and space. 
so that you're somewhere in the house where you're not going to be interrupted. If you are, it's not the end of the world, but you know, uninterrupted, safe, quiet space. Um, you might want, want to wear, you know, headphones for the empowerment to really absorb yourself in the process. That can be really useful. Um, I think it's useful to do even just like a ritual ish clean, like say you're in your home office and you've got a big stack of papers there to like just tidy them and set them to one side, even one little act of cleaning can kind of help lift your mind. So remember that all these outer behaviors are just psychological tools to get you into the right headspace, that it's not really ever about those external behaviors, but 100% they help get you in the right headspace if you don't do it with a tight mind. You know, if you do it with a really happy mind, it's like, oh, I'm going to have this nice picture framed. How about I get some nice flowers from my garden? And it really uplifts your mind to do it. It really does help prepare you. But if that feels like pressure or if it feels like a chore, it defeats the purpose. So always remember the psychology underneath these behaviors. It's not like a checklist because it's somehow good from its own side. It's only good if you bring a good mind to it. But yeah, absolutely. Picture of the deity, couple of offerings, nice little clean. Yeah, Christina. Yes, yes. Um, the preliminaries like um, uh, swooshing with water, as I said before, just brush your teeth, drink some water before you come into the space. And um, it is good if you have some holy objects somewhere even if it's just your computer screen with Rinpoche on it, do three prostrations. Physically do them. If your knees hurt, just put your hands together, but do prostrations before you sit and start. Yeah. In terms of the self-entry practice that the Lama does, they're aware that there are people online doing the empowerment. Um, so they're holding you in their mandala. You don't have to worry about that side of things. The Lama's got you covered. Yeah. Yeah. Other questions? Other questions? Good. Okay, so we'll keep going with the empowerment process. Okay. Yep, so, yep, you prostrate and sit down, and now you request the empowerment. Yeah, go ahead. Requesting the empowerment. So what will happen in this part is that the Lama is going to say things in Tibetan. Occasionally, he will say them in English. Occasionally, the translator will be able to spit it out in English quick enough for you to understand what's going on or not, right? This is a, going to be a variable thing, but the teacher wants you to repeat after them. And what you're repeating after them is, I'd like the empowerment, <laughs> okay? It's just in Tibetan. So they'll go, you know, some, 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 and you'll go some, 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 and you have no idea what your pronunciation's like. You don't know Tibetan. You don't know what's going on. Relax, do your best, and think, I agree. I want this empowerment. Why do we do this? It's because we're not prophetizers, right? It's because we're not missionaries. Like, he's only going to offer something that we request. So he wants to hear you request so he's not just kind of like imposing an empowerment on you, you know? So it's a great gift of fundamentalism prevention that you request first, yes? So, you know, you're not being force fed this. If, if someone, if everyone's requesting and then someone's like, oh wait, I don't wanna be here. Well, go, that's fine. Now, you know, you know? So the first things that you'll be repeating after the Lama are the request. And then you're going to have um, rice for offerings and dispelling hindrances is often passed out. And this is part of the process called the gektor. A gek is a hindering spirit. What are hindering spirits? Your own superstitions. Okay? <laughs> They're your own superstitions. Are there external hindering spirits? Probably. What are the worst ones? Your own superstitions. Okay. The outer influences are only influences if you're allowing them, if you're being weird about it, if you're opening to them, if you're feeling distracted by them. There are countless beings in every space, enlightened ones and hindering ones, all the time, always. Kind of ignore them, except the holy beings. Yeah. The gektor is really to kind of clear all of your emotional baggage that you came in with all of your preconceptions about not being good enough or being too amazing, 
yeah, too high, too low. It's kind of just clear in the slate for you to just be here now. So the Gektor is a lot of smells and bells and throwing of things and really just think all of my garbage is going outside. All of my inner stuff is going outside. So logistically, one of the attendants is going to pass around a big bowl of rice and you're each going to take some rice. Usually what happens is the front row gets a big amount and go ahead and stop screen share for a minute. So everyone takes a bit of rice in the front row and then they pass it behind them and you've maybe seen this in empowerments and there's a passing and passing and the, the pile gets smaller and smaller as, as you go back to the back of the room. And what you do is you kind of hold that little bit of rice and you think this symbolizes all of my superstition. This symbolizes all of my crap. This is all the things I don't want to take with me in my practice anymore, particularly in this empowerment. And then the attendant will walk back the other way and you'll see people chucking rice at him. <laughs> yeah, and they're like, why are they throwing rice at the attendant? Poor guy, you know, they're like just pelting him with rice, you know, and it's to get it into his bowl again. Yeah, they're trying to kind of hit so that some of their grains of rice that they've thought of as their garbage go back into his rice bowl. Whether that happens or not doesn't really matter. It's symbolic. But then he takes the garbage rice <laughs> and he puts a little bit in the mandala of the chanting leader. Sometimes he gives a little bit to the teacher and all of that is offered out. Okay. So it's like the Lama's like, okay, I see you. I see all your nonsense. Yep. I see you. It's fine. And out. Okay. And so then you'll see the Lama do, um, a lot of loud bell ringing. There'll be a wee tiny cake with three little cakes on it and candles. Yes. And there'll be a whole turning around business. There'll be a whole turning around business. There'll be a running out business. There'll be a lot of incense. Okay. So brace yourselves. There's going to be a lot of incense more than seems necessary. It's great. Just go with it. Okay. Think of it as a fumigation. Yeah, it's a fumigation of your superstitions. And so they use black frankincense to fumigate. Later in the empowerment, they use white frankincense to invoke. Fun fact, black, in, black frankincense getting out, white frankincense bringing in, symbolic, okay? So when the attendant is bringing all of this incense around, don't be too claustrophobic if you have asthma stuff or worries about respiratory stuff. It's just in the beginning that there's all that incense and then he's gonna take it outside. So, you know, step out if you have to, but don't worry, it's not gonna be the whole empowerment is gonna smell that way. He's fumigating symbolically. Okay, so as the teacher sends his attendant out with the, the plate with the three little cakes, he's going to throw mustard seeds at his attendant. The attendant is not offended, don't worry, because he's really sending out all of the gecks, the hindering spirits, get out of this space, clean slate. Yeah, so that process can happen quite quickly at the very beginning of the empowerment. And for the helpers, they have to be kind of on their game and ready to go. But for most of us, you can just sit quietly and enjoy the spectacle that you may or may not understand. And what you're meditating on is, may I take this with a pure heart? Yeah, without superstition, without self-loathing, without self-aggrandizement, without annoyance at my broader brothers and sisters. Here we go. Yeah, it's your launch sequence into the empowerment. Are there um, Gektor questions? or Gektor additions, older students that would like to add fun facts. Sometimes His Holiness doesn't do Gektors anymore. He just kind of says meditate on emptiness and we're off. So some teachers might not do it anymore, but it sounds like Jada Rinpoche will. Yeah, Gektor. All right, so share screen. Okay. So um, then number four, the requesting mandala is offered as well as the ritual offering of body, speech, and mind. And all the people receiving the empowerment must visualize that they are requesting the an offering, but one member of the assembly stands and performs the ritual on behalf of everyone. So usually it's one person. Sometimes it's a person for mandala, for body, for speech, for mind, for the monetary offering. And it's a whole line of people. Often it's just one. You don't just watch that line like, huh, what's going on? You have to think that's me. 
They're doing this on behalf of me. They're representing me. You're requesting the mandala. They're just the ones standing up and doing it. So it's again, this creating the cause and requesting energy that we wanna have, saying, I want this, I value this. So you imagine you're offering the whole universe because what I in this universe is more important than transformation, for, than heart opening, than moving towards enlightenment. There's nothing more important than enlightenment. Yeah, so you imagine offering the whole universe and that's what the first person is offering that has the five little kind of towers on it and then the five colored kata behind them. They're offering the whole universe on behalf of all of us. And then next comes a statue representing enlightened body, a text representing enlightened speech and a stupa representing enlightened mind. And then there'll be an offering with some like financial contributions from the group the amount doesn't matter, it's symbolic. It's this idea that if you contribute to something, you're more invested in it. If you just kind of take it for granted, you're more passive. So that little envelope then goes on the desk of the Lama, and then whoever's the last person in the line puts the kata over the Lama's desks, really anchoring, we request. Yeah, okay. So there's the Gektor. Yep, sometimes the mandala is before the Gektor. Okay, so up to this point, our, all four classes of tantric empowerment are similar. Occasionally some aspect is abbreviated. This is all at the discretion of the Lama. Um, all tantric empowerments include bodhisattva vows. Yeah, all of them. Um, highest yoga tantra empowerments also have taught tantric vows and the commitment of succession guru yoga and we're thinking also yoga tantra as well so sometimes there is the add-on of a daily sadhana and mantra commitment sometimes and sometimes not and that's again at the discretion of the lama or often related to the deity that you're practicing go ahead for um, highest yoga tantra and great action tantra um, and also this one that we're going to do kunrig which is yoga tantra there's a dream analysis section on the second day and usually the lama will walk you through it and this is the reason for getting the things like the kusha grass and the blindfolds and the um, protection cords this happens on the kind of preliminary day they give you these blessed substances you put them under your bed you see what your dreams are like see if you get auspicious dreams that this practice is good for you or you get challenging dreams saying maybe it's too soon or maybe you have obstacles and the next day the lama says Whatever you dream, don't worry about it. Here we go. <laughs> yeah, so that's what happens. Um, occasionally, you know, if you get something really troubling, you know, you can mention it to a senior member of the Sangha or the teacher if it seems like, wow, this was really vivid, maybe I should check. But for the most part, it's just interesting information about your affinity for the practice. And sometimes you're just too tired and you don't even realize your dreams. So fun facts, okay. All right, keep going. And um, there's recommended reading. Yeah, so <clears throat> prior to receiving the empowerment, uh, Lama Song Kappa has written a beautiful book called uh, Preparing for Tantra, The Mountain of Blessings. It's available in English. And then the classic Introduction to Tantra by Lama Yeshi and Images in, of Enlightenment by John Landau and Andy Weber. This is a book of tantric images, but it also gives a good summary of most of the main ones. Then after receiving The World of Tibetan Buddhism, Deity Yoga by His Holiness, and Tantra, Geshitashi Sering, The Six Session Guru Yoga by Ken Rinpoche Lozang Tarchin. This one has a really good description of each of the Bodhisattva vows and each of the tantric vows, and it's really very clear. So I really recommend that one. And then Journey Without Goal by Chugim Trimpa Rinpoche explains a lot about the symbolism within the empowerment and a lot about the five Buddha families. So that's a really good resource about the five Buddha families. So um, the empowerment will go like that. There's a whole bunch of stuff in the middle that we're not talking about because we can't, okay? But it's gonna be related to the five Buddha families. It's gonna be substances, none of which will hurt you. Um, and if you're concerned because you have like lactose intolerance and there's something that looks like it has the aspect of yogurt, you can just think that you're taking it. 
Okay, if there's something that looks like it has the aspect of alcohol and you're an, a recovering alcoholic, you can just imagine you're taking it and not take it literally. So anything you're concerned about, you can just visualize is happening. And um, last questions before we call it a night. Yeah. So, you know, you got mandala, you got gektor, a whole bunch of stuff in between and another mandala to end. That book ending process, the mandala at the end is like in thanks of the whole process. And really, I, I want us to all do empowerments with a mind that says how lucky we are, how wonderful this is. When I am bewildered, I will figure it out later. I have to take responsibility for my own practice and research stuff. But you know what? It's not like this is the first time we're ever going to take an empowerment or the last time, I should say. You'll do the same one again and again. Yeah, just because you took it once doesn't mean that's the end. The next time you do it, it'll go deeper and deeper. And if you do the retreat, you can empower yourself. And that is a huge blessing because you purify all your vows that way, among other things. Great. So you all have that document. Um, again, Burzen website is great. Study Buddhism. Uh, final thoughts? <laughs> right. More, please. So um, if you have any suge program suggestions related to this topic, see your friendly local SPC. Now we dedicate. Janchu Semcho Rimpo She Ma Ke Pa Nam Ke Gyo Chi Ke Pa Nyam Pa Me Pa Yang Go Ne Gon Du Pao Wan May the precious Bodhi mind that has not yet arisen arise and grow. May that which has arisen not decline, but increase forevermore. And remember the lack of inherently existent agent, action, and object all lack inherent existence because they dependently arise.